it's, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces back for the third in our visiting lecture series from slavery to freedom. I'm Al Jacobs, the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, and it's our pleasure on behalf of President McPherson and Provost Simon to welcome you to the Big Ten Room at Kellogg Center today for what I know will be another very, very enjoyable and informative afternoon. I had the pleasure, along with a few others, uh, including undergraduate students, to have lunch with Dr. Lowry today. And uh, he is not shy about speaking. He chooses his words well and speaks to the point. And so I'm looking forward to today's presentation as much as I look forward to the last two and next Thursday, we'll be back at the Kellogg Center again for the fourth in the Black History Month series of visiting lectures. My responsibility is to introduce to you the introducer. And let me do that by saying, in 1960, I started to college as an undergraduate at Southern Illinois. 1960 was an interesting year because in that year, both presidential candidates came to my undergraduate school. I got to see two presidential candidates and shake hands with both of them the same year. Concurrent with that, there was this unrest going on in the South that Joe Lowry and Bill Anderson and Martin Luther King and some other people were beginning to stir up. And it stirred up some things for the better of our society, I do believe. These are two giants on whose shoulders others have stood. These are two people that were confidants of Dr. King. Bill Anderson, as I've told you in previous introductions, is a treasure of the osteopathic profession. He was there for the civil rights movement. He was there as a leader of the osteopathic profession. I could talk on and on about the introducer, but I want to allow him the chance to introduce our speaker today. Let me introduce my friend and colleague, Bill Anderson Dio. And while Alan Jacobs was making that introduction, it reminded me of one of those occasions in Albany, Georgia, at the height of the civil rights struggle, when it was the responsibility of the late Ralph David Abernathy to introduce Martin Luther King, Jr. And Ralph used to tell about the time when he had some people visiting with him, and some who were not familiar with the modern conveniences, like a washing machine and indoor toilets and refrigerators and the like. And they saw this peculiar machine in the back there. And they looked in the machine and they saw this paddle inside of the machine. And that paddle would move the clothes back and forth. And they called it an agitator. And he says, you know, I used to get offended when they would call me an agitator until I found out what an agitator was that an agitator, my mother said, is a thing that you have in that machine that gets the dirt out. And that's what we're here for, to get the dirt out. And there was a lot of dirt where we came from. So when you speak of the civil rights movement of the last century, you cannot help but include notables like Joe Lowry, our speaker for today. I was telling Joe on our way up here today that there are not many of us left when you recognize the fact that Martin Luther King Jr., had he been alive today, would be 72 years old. He had surrounded himself by established leaders at that time. They were the established ministers primarily. They are, the movement started in churches. And I said to Joe, you know, most of us were older than Martin. Now you start to figure it. <laughs> He would be 72 today, and those of us who were with him at the time, members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, were older than him. That means me and Joe are among those who were with him, and we got to be a little bit older than he would be if he were living today. Because mind you, I want you to know age has its advantages. First, we were there. So when we speak about the good old days, we know about those good old days. We were there. We don't have to have anybody to tell us how it was then. 
But I said to Joe, there are not many of us left. You know, we are a dying breed. We will all be in our 70s and some in our 80s. We are a dying breed. But there are still those people who hunger and thirst for the message that Martin Luther King brought. And it's up to us to carry that message on. So I want you to use Joe Lowry like you use me, Dean, and like we use the Wyatt Walkers and the Charles Adams, and like we use others who were with Dr. King, who had the opportunity of walking with him, living with him, going to jail with him. We are the ones who put our finger in that wound that was inflicted on Martin Luther King back in 1968 in Memphis. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you, present to some, Joe Lowry, who has been in the struggle for many, many years, having served for many years as the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He is recognized as a great preacher. For those of you who read Ebony Magazine, and I recommend that, by the way, I recommend to all of you to read Ebony Magazine. Don't just read the Bushisms, that's the latest book out. Read Ebony Magazine, and you will find him among the top 15 Baptists, not just Baptists, excuse me, Joe, Methodist also, 15 top black ministers in the United States today. And he has not been included there once, but twice. He is considered one of the most outstanding, one of the best, most highly revered, most highly regarded leaders in the African American community, and has emerged as a leader in America in gaining rights for those who are underserved and underprivileged. So I am indeed privileged and it is indeed a pleasure for me to introduce and present to you Joe Lowry. Joe Lowry. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's indeed uh, good to be here on this uh, campus and to have an opportunity to share uh, in this series and uh, during Black History Month, uh, uh, I would suggest that we not limit and restrict our observance and study of Black History Month to, to the month of February. Uh, Dick Gregory says that you, you know if they were going to give us a month, it would be February, <laughs> because February is the shortest month in the year. <laughs> For that was why they, so we, we don't need to stop. But it's good to be here, good to be with my friend uh, Andy Anderson and uh, enjoyed the lunch today. I, I looked back in my contract, I didn't see a, a speech uh, on the contract for lunch, but they got it in anyway. And, and, uh, but it's good to be with you. And I, I, I uh, Andy kept pushing me for topic. And uh, talk about black history. You know, we got to have a specific topic. So I, I gave him one. I've almost forgotten what it was. <laughs> I think it's all this little, it's all this little pamphlet here, profiling the impact of the black presence in America. And the reason I, I chose that was that uh, we, we racial profiling, of course, is one of the key issues in in this country today as we look at the criminal justice system. and But there's a good racial profiling that I'd like to, to deal with for a few moments today, just like there's, you know, there's a good crazy and there's a bad crazy. Some people say, you know, you're crazy. Sometimes you're complimenting people who are crazy. The Bible said, Paul said he was afflicted with the foolishness of preaching. That's a, that's a good foolishness. There's another kind of foolishness, which is a you know, foolish foolishness. And uh, so I want to talk about racial profiling from the perspective of, of the black presence in this country uh, and, and, and what, uh, what impact has it had on our national life and on, on, on the national psyche. It's a sort of kind of theological, sociological, political perspective on the black experience in this country. And being a preacher, I have two texts. I, I realize the state institution, we have to respect separation of church and state. But as I said today, go ahead and arrest me if I, 
violated. I need to rest anyway. I haven't, <laughs> haven't been in jail now in two or three years. So, and I don't think I've ever been in jail in, in, in Lansing. I don't know what it is in jail like. So if I, if I violate it, so I have two texts. And one of them is, is from Second Timothy. And uh, uh, these I discovered I can't get out of Detroit till 8 o'clock. And, and so we've got a lot of time. <laughs> about an hour on each text and, and that ought to cover the subject you don't expect me to talk about profiling of black presence all these years in, in 15 or 20 minutes okay that would be disrespectful but the text really uh, one, the one is in, in Second Timothy the first chapter and beginning with the fifth verse Paul was talking to a young man that he had Mentor was mentoring in the ministry, and he said to Timothy, When I reflect on your genuine faith, which first dwelled in your grandmother Lois and, and your mother Eunice, and now I'm persuaded dwells in you, therefore stir up, uh, some of the translation says, rekindle or fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. God did not give us the spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And I like that as I think about profiling the black experience in this country. That uh, and in 1 Peter, the other text in 1 Peter, the second chapter says, You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, an extraordinary, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so I hope you, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, it's all right, write it down on the notepad of your mind and when you get home, look them up. I, I, uh, I think we have to, I look at history for, for two very important reasons. I think it's very important to know where you come from. If you don't know where you come from, you won't know when somebody's taking you back. And uh, so we can resist any attempt to reverse the movement toward uh, the fulfillment of our dreams and goals if we know where we come from. And it's equally important to know who we are. And, and tracing our history gives us an opportunity to, to engage in the purposeful and authentic identification of who we be. And I know that's not quite the grammar I should use in this context on hallowed halls of learning, but uh, who we be is, uh, is, is historical. And uh, there are those who, who raise the question about our identity were not concerned about the grammatical proprieties and so forth. But the important thing about knowing who we are is that if you don't know who you are, you may come to believe that you are who your enemies say you are. And our enemies have a lot of definitions of us. And if we aren't careful, we may begin to believe them. But if we know our roots and the fruits of our roots and so forth, and I want to, I want to, from that perspective, the going and coming of our four parents, uh, and theology is never static. Deeply rooted but never restricted. God's revelation is a continuum. And we must define ourselves, and we do it through the meetings of our history, from Diop to Douglas to Du Bois, from Mandela to Martin, from Truth to Tubman. We must define ourselves. And we made a mistake once not defining integration. We let other folks define integration. And we had to put a stop to that as soon as we understood that it was a misdefinition because they attempted to define integration as the systematic movement of all things black to all things white. And that is not what we consider an authentic definition. But rather it is the emphatic movement of all things wrong to all things right, not black to white, so that we resist the diminution of black institutions and so forth, it's not necessary to, 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 to move from integrate. But let me move on to the thing. And our, our profile in this country moves beyond 
individual achievements to a collective institutional cultural deposits in the National Bank, which the nation has drawn interest from and dividends from our deposits. And so I want to take three, because I want to be homiletically correct, take, take three points. I don't know. Uh, preachers know that. I, I don't know where that came from, but homiletically correct, three points. I guess one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Spirit. The first point I would argue in terms of profiling the black experience in this country is that we have demonstrated the power of the human spirit to translate adversity into opportunity. And I believe we've done it better than any group in human history. And that's what I like what Paul said to Timothy. For we, God didn't give us the timidity, the spirit of timidity, but power to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Grandmother used to say, life give you a lemon, take the water of hope, sugar of faith, and stir it up. That's what they mean by shake well before using it. You see on the labels of your bottles of medicine, if life hands us a lemon, stir it up, and, and you can turn it into lemonade. The black experience has demonstrated that in no uncertain terms, we have overcome the many dangers, toils, and snares. Barriers, mountains, legal, psychological, political, social, and economic. We've navigated treacherous seas. We've negotiated turbulent air lanes. We've crossed many raging rivers, and yet there are almost always one more river to cross. Sometimes we do it with plain old mother wit. Sometimes, like Lois and Eunice in our background, sometimes with scholarly research like Charles Drew, sometimes with simple faith like my paternal grandmother, but we have been able to take that which was meant to demean and dehumanize us and translate it into opportunities to discover who we are and help America discover who she is. I remember my grandmother, who I think I mentioned at lunch today, I'm from the north, north Alabama. <laughs> uh, I've always been in Atlanta, but my grandmother, Mom Polly, we call her, lived down the street from where we lived near the railroad. She worked there as a domestic in a big house around the corner. And she told us, and I was a very small lad, that the first several years she worked at that house, they would not let her come in the front door. Now that surprised me because Mom Polly was what we called a bad dudess. She didn't take any mess. And I said, how did you deal with not being able to go in the front door? She says, well, uh, I had to work. I had two little boys, one of them was your daddy. And I had to deal with the situation. I said, yeah, but it's so dehumanizing. She said, you know, black hands could, could knead dough into bread and for, for their hungry stomachs. So or even her black breast could feed hungry white mouths. But she couldn't come in the front door. How would you deal with it, Mom Polly? She said, well, I'll tell you what I did. I'd go in the back door in the morning, and they would say, good morning, Polly. And I wouldn't say nothing. I said, how you doing, Polly? And she said, open my mouth. So I go to the closet and get the apron out tie it around my waist, get the bra, go out the front door, sweep off the front porch. <laughs> and I throw my shoulders back, open the door, and that was the first time for us. I was concerned that I went in the house that morning. <laughs> Translating adversity into opportunity, discovered her selfhood through the the, 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 the stumbling block that she translated into stepping stone. I would submit to you that that brand of power enable us to move from slave ships to spaceships, from log cabins to governor's mansion, from city jail to city hall. 
a sour chord of discrimination transposed into a symphony of agitation and determination. Every round goes higher. From being unable to get out of members as a young fellow, I made my first application for an American Express card. <laughs> I very seldom leave home without it. <laughs> but I remember my first application, they turned me down. And, and as I searched it, they gave, didn't have enough credit, didn't have enough experience, and that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was they weren't giving black folks an American Express card in those days. But uh, through our search for, for, for humanity and justice, we moved from not being able to, to get an American Express card to right now being on the verge of black man of a chief executive officer of the American Express Corporation because we learned how to translate adversity into opportunity. Uh, we haven't got there yet, but we, we're on the way and we, we, we've made many way stations. Uh, some folks want to make us think they're destinations, but they're just way stations. We're just moving right along until that day comes when justice will totally, completely roll down like water. And a man's a man for all that. I suggest to you that, that one of the profiling points for the black presence in this country collectively has been the power, demonstrating the power of the human spirit to overcome. I remember reading, and you have as sociologists and psychologists indicated clearly that we couldn't survive slavery. We not only survived, we multiplied. We were able to translate adversity into opportunity. That's why I tell our young people today, I don't like your whining about what you haven't got. Stir up what you have got. And one of the things we have is the historicity of the black experience that, that translated adversity into opportunity. The young man stated today, you know, I'd do better if I had uh, a father at home. I didn't have a father at home. I was raised by a single parent. So you don't talk that stuff to me. Because the best man I ever knew, the man who influenced my life positively more than anybody else, was my father who was raised by a single parent, Mom Polly. Of course it's ideal, of course it's better, but if you haven't got it, don't, don't make it a crutch so that you don't live up to your responsibility, you don't keep the charge you have, and you don't understand that out of your history, those who believed they could fly reached out and up, translated adversity into opportunity. That's, and, 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 and the black presence has demonstrated that to the world through what happened. I think number two, I would say that the impact that I profile of black presence in this country is that individually and collectively, we demonstrate in unparalleled fashion and uncontradictable effectiveness what authentic patriotism is about. I think we are the original true blue patriots, or true black, true brown, patriots. We, we, we define what authentic patriotism is. We, we, we have demonstrated what it really means to love your country. There used to be bumper stickers in Georgia, Alabama, not in Michigan. There were bumper stickers that said, love it or leave it. Hello. I don't think that you know that Michigan don't stuck that way. There were some in Georgia. It was a scary Michigan. Excuse me, I'm for bringing that up. <laughs> but the, these bumper stickers did not represent authentic patriotism. Authentic patriotism is not smothering the country any more than authentic parenting is smothering a child. Authentic patriotism is challenging the country to live up to its noble creed and, and, and tenets and precepts and concepts. It, it, it's loving it so much you're not going to leave it alone until it straightens up and flies right. And, and we define authentic patriotism by saying that, that we take those, those things that you, you proclaim in your independence and we wrap them around our own destiny. And, and so we've defined what patriotism is. We love the country so much we wouldn't tolerate its injustice. 
not burn it down, but challenge it to rise above its failure to meet its own challenges. We fill up a jail because we love the country, not because we love jail. I did not go to jail at all. I'm in jail in some of the other places. I didn't miss all of it. But we didn't go to jail because we loved jail. We went to jail because we loved freedom and we loved the country so much. Rather than burn you down, we'd go to jail and suffer ourselves that you might burn and, and in an incinerator of, of, of agony and, and, and a catharsis of, of, of a spiritual revolution, you might come out of those ashes a better country. We come out of better people. So that's what patriotism is. We've challenged the nation, not just because we fought and died in every war, that's patriotism too, but, but not just because a black person being convicted of treason is, is uh, uh, as rare as a cotton patch in the North Pole, but because we've challenged the nation to honor her noble ideals of liberty and justice. And we say to a nation, you. You said you this, we borrowed Barry White, caught that spirit when he said you brag about this and brag about that. Let's get it on and see if you really mean what you, let's practice what you preach. And, and, and that's love in the nation. So that, that's authentic patriotism. It's not tolerating her failure to live up or challenging her to, to do the right thing. And because of our willingness to suffer, to bring out of the nation that which was glorious in her. Uh, we think we've got a better nation. We think Booker T. Washington was right. He said to them, you can't stay in a ditch without a part of, you know, you can't keep a man in a ditch without a part of you remaining in the ditch with him. And so we want out of the ditch. And so in order to get out of it, we're going to take you back up and get away from the ditch. Your own, your own disaster is, is in peril. And, and so that, that became the kind of patriotism that enabled both the country. The country's a better place today because we've removed the barriers of segregation that crippled her and denied equal opportunity and denied the oneness of the human family. I remember, I think, a very graphic example of that. I was in Nashville once working, and the office was in the upper room building, and uh, uh, we were trying to desegregate public accommodation. That was before the Public Accommodation Act passed, and we were sitting in in various restaurants and meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and so forth. Down the street from the upper room, there toward Vanderbilt, was a little hamburger joint that uh, I decided would be my personal project. That I would be the instrument to desegregate that restaurant. And I used to go down there and sit on the stool and say, Give me a hamburger and a cordy cordy. And uh, the white waitress said, We don't serve Negroes here. I said, I don't remember ordering Negroes. I thought I had <laughs> a hamburger and a corny corny. And uh, she said, well, whatever, Reverend. You ain't going to get it here. And I said, well, all right. So then I had my wife prepare me a little sandwich. Every time I was in town, I would go down to that little restaurant and put my sandwich on the table, open it up, unscrew my thermos. But first, I'd ask her, hamburger and corny corny? She'd shake her head. I would eat the sandwich. I, I was very neat, though. I would fold the paper that I brought the sandwich in neatly before I left it on the counter and, and left and went on. Went on like about two weeks. And uh, it wasn't as simple as it sounded because there were some funny looking folks sitting in there sometimes when I went in there, most of the time by myself. But I really, they didn't know it, but I really wasn't alone. I had on the whole arm. Uh, hello? Come on. I, 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 I didn't have any bodyguard that they could see. And I didn't have on a bulletproof vest, but I had something called a whole armor of God at the breastplate. But anyway, I was out of town when the, finally the mayor and the city council all got together, even before then, before the Civil Rights Act, and they passed all of it, opened up everything. And, and that's, I couldn't wait to get back from my little project. 
And uh, when I got back, uh, walked in the restaurant, and this little lady, this little same waitress was standing there going, I could have sworn I heard her say, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> I went and sat down at the counter. I said, I want to. She said, I know. Hamburger and a coolie coolie. <laughs> and uh, she brought it, and she brought it. I, I make a little confession. I it wasn't worth all that trouble. <laughs> but, but, but listen, a shocking thing happened to me. She said, may I pay for your hamburger? I said, pay for what? She said, may I pay for your hamburger? I said, yes, but would you please tell me? She said yes, and then she started to speak, and she got choked up. The tears began to fall down her cheek. And she said, I'll tell you why. She said, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of a church. And she said, every, every time I had to refuse to serve you, something grabbed my heart. Talk with my employer, he said, no, we can't serve him. And I, I had to work. I have four little boys, and my husband was killed in an automobile accident. I couldn't quit my job. I went to my pastor, my pastor and I prayed together. My pastor told me to hold on. Everything would be all right. I guess what he told her was that weeping may endure for a night. But joy coming in the morning. I read that somewhere. That's what he must have told her. And she, anyway, she held on. But she said, you don't know what a burden is off my soul. You don't know the sleepless nights that I spent because another child of God came in who was another color and I couldn't serve because God made him black. Ah, well, she said, quite black. And we both sat there like fools crying at the Let's got her over a hamburger. Cool it, cool it. You know what she was really saying to me? She was saying, free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. The black presidents in this country free America. Remove from her soul the stains of, 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 of the dehumanizing practice of segregation and, 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 and discrimination. So I would say that in authentic racial profiling has to list as one of the most important contributions to this country. We made America a better country. And it wasn't just America. You know, we did it all over the world. I talked to a young man from China who stood in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square. He said, you ever stand in front of a tank? I said, no, I did not. <laughs> Best I ever did was a garbage truck. We stood in front of <laughs> in front of a garbage truck in Atlanta and, and, and everybody thought I was brave and the other I was and the garbage truck was coming and I said hey, let's stand right in the middle and everybody thought we were so brave <laughs> the reason was the, the, the thing was high in the middle and if we had run over us we probably could have laid down and went right over <laughs> and been on the side the wheels is destroyed as the Palestinian did the other day we went spanking in China, the movement, the impact of the black presence in, in defining authentic patriotism. From Philadelphia to Peking, from Selma to Soweto, from Montgomery to Manila, that impact. In, I believe it was in 90, while I was still president of SCLC, in East Berlin. They were dedicating a hospital and children's uh, elementary school in the name of Martin Luther King. They wanted me to come as Martin's linear successor to dedicate it, and I went. Atlanta Constitution newspaper sent a young black reporter with me. Very interesting, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, I preach, and I don't, I don't have but one context I preach, I have to preach human rights and love of God, 
oneness of the human family, liberty and justice. And the people would, the interpreter would say it. I just had to hope he, my German was rusty. I had to hope he was saying what I said. And the people were seemingly bowing. And that night, the reporter said to me, we had two or three more lectures. The young reporter said, Doc, you better be careful. We ain't never going to get out of it. East Berlin said, you're talking all that liberty and human rights before these communists. <laughs> well, maybe we won't, but I can't preach any other way. The next day, it's the same thing. And people applauded, and, and uh, we wondered if we made any impact. And I came on back home. And a few months later, uh, I was watching on CNN. And, and, and some of those same folks, I recognized some of those people who were marching toward the wall, singing. We shall overcome. I, Reagan can't take total credit for bringing down the president. <laughs> it was my preaching. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was my representation of, of the black experience, of the black movement, of the black plea, of the black insistence, of the black demand, of the black crusade for liberty and justice that inspired. And they brought that Berlin Wall down. And they, I guess they would have some Josh, if it developed in Jericho, if they had known it. And the walls came tumbling down. That, if you want to profile the impact of the black presence in this country, you have to spread it beyond our borders. It's all over the world. I listened to Nelson Mandela one day as I talked with him in Soweto after his liberation. And he said that, that those days in, in the 20, among the 27 years he spent in prison, that he found strength in watching on television his brothers and sisters in the country marching and going to jail for liberty and justice. And he said it gave him strength to endure the suffering in his 27 years. And because we march, because we dare present our bodies as living sacrifices, because we dare sought to define patriotism. Because we dare say this country, you can never be what you ought to be as long as you remain in the ditch holding back a segment of your population. Third and final point I would make in terms of Some economic difference too. I, I just have to think about this. The, the first summer after the passage of the Public Accommodations Act, and we had a family reunion in Memphis. My wife's people were in Memphis, and we must have been about 40, 45 of us, uh, in addition to the three or four hundred children and grandchildren that were with us. And we stayed in the, in the, in the, in the Holiday Inn. And uh, by the time we left, place was a mess. Uh, I mean, the kids, I mean, they, the maids had that they had work. And when we left, we went down to the hall, my brother-in-law and I, we put five dollars on every bed in the hotel, tip for the maid. And when we were packing up in the car, the, the maid who was in charge, she said, listen, I want to thank y'all. So I'm glad this year's segregation thing come about. <laughs> I'm talking about the impact <laughs> of the black experience and the black movement on the country. It opened the eyes. Finally, I would say that the black presence has demonstrated and must include establishing not only the efficacy of nonviolence in achieving social change, but the strength inherent in the application of the moral imperatives of our faith to political, social, and economic problems. And, and, and that's why, you know, the, the, the movement came out of the black church. Not only because the black church was a free institution, the preacher was accountable to his congregation, but because the issues were basically moral, Issues. And as I shared this afternoon, uh, uh, if you discriminate against me because I'm dirty, it's my fault. 
I have a responsibility. But if you're discriminated against me because I'm loud and uncouth, that's my fault. You discriminate against me because I'm ignorant. It's my fault. To a large extent, because there are all kinds of opportunities to do that. But if you discriminate against me because I'm black, you have to take that up with a higher authority. So that makes the whole issue of our relationship moral, theological, biblical, if you will, ethical, spiritual. That's what I think the New Testament when it said, how can you love God whom you've never seen? And not hate his children whom, you know, not love his children whom you see every day when you mess with a child. You mess up. One was Thanksgiving in Atlanta a few years ago, when Dixie. When Dixie doesn't based in Florida, they operated strong in the South, and they rediscovered they were, didn't have any black managers, and they were selling South African products during the time of fighting to free South Africa. And so we boycotted Windex. I mean, we boycotted Windex. We boycotted Windex. We boycotted Windex. I remember the, uh, the uh, uh, I went to see the old Story about desegregating hiring managers, taking those South African products out. He said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, Well, we don't have to withdraw our patronage for us to cooperate with your evil. Make us as guilty as you are. We have to withdraw our patronage. He said, That's all right. He said, You go ahead and boycott with me. He said, I'm going to lower the price of my chicken down to about 15 cents a pound. And a little old colored lady to walk right over your picket line and buy my chicken. I said, that price, I'll join them. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't buy anything but the chickens. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll bankrupt you. But, but, but we, we, we were trying, we, we, the boycott, a boycott applies moral imperatives. It is wrong to participate in an evil system of your own volition. So you, you can't pass the buck here. Uh, it, it's wrong when, when Andy was mayor of uh, Atlanta, he and I had a little problem. They had a campaign to arrest all the prostitutes. And for some reason, they hung out at the block where our office was, our office house, and they used to arrest the prostitutes. I went and I said, Andy, something wrong. How can you arrest them and not arrest, you know, you, how you arrest them? seller of the product and not arrest the purchaser. Hello? And I said, if you don't stop it, we're going to demonstrate against you in City Hall. And so they start arresting the hymns as well as the hers. And the whole thing. There's a moral issue involved. If it's wrong, just set it. Whatever it is. It's wrong to buy it. If it's wrong to do it, it's wrong to cooperate with it. And when we apply the moral imperatives of the faith to those kind of topics, power is available. When Dixie would never voluntarily change his policy and stop selling those South African products that were dipped in the blood of our brothers and sisters under apartheid. But their understanding of an economic issue or a moral issue was written in dollar sign. I guess that's the reason I like the word equity today. And better than I do equality. You just write it in justice and equity. People don't understand equality. Everybody understands equity. It's spelled with a dollar sign. So we're fighting for equity. That's one of the last frontiers. Our our, our median income is still only about 60% of the median income of, of white Americans. It's a moral issue. So we, 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 we struggle and strive to, to apply those moral imperatives to the political, social, and economic problems. I like equity as a man. I'll tell you this story. I think I had a man down in South Georgia who went in business selling rabbit sausage. Uh, you ever hear rabbit sausage? No? <coughs> yeah, got that. I haven't gotten up here yet. <laughs> uh, a lot of 
stop him, didn't eat pork, so he made rabbits out of that. He was about to get rich. Problem was, the community got scarce. Rabbits got scarce. And he had to find a substitute, so he chose horses. Did you ever eat horse meat? Are you sure? Well, anyway, he, he made horse meat. They probably can still call it rabbit pot. And the food and drug people came by and said, we understand that you are deceiving the public. And one of them said, you selling something called rabbit sausage, but it's really horse sausage. And the man said, no, sir. He said, well, how do you say it's equal? The man says, equal? So yeah, he said, well, if it's equal, you might get by Tim and how you make it. He said, well, it's equal. Every time I put in one rabbit, I put in one horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suggest that, that it may have been equal, but it wasn't equitable. And so the moral imperatives of our faith apply to social and political and economic problems. You demonstrate it. That doesn't work. That you don't have to be afraid to appeal to people's conscience. Because there is a reservoir of good and goodwill in most people. And we have to continue to find ways to use the power of that which is right. Deserted the good spouse of spirituality today. And the challenge for all of us, we shack it up with the prostitute of materialism and greed. It's an incestuous affair. And like all incestuous affairs, you really produce offspring with congenital defects, racism, sexism, addictions, drugs, and guns. Economic exploitation. We need a rebirth of the spirituality within all our communities to press the economic policies and the economic programs of this country, not just to be sponsored by a church, but to reflect, and that's the, one of the problems with the faith-based proposal, is that there is no guarantee yet that they will carry with them requisites for justice, that there can be no discrimination in these programs. We have to demonstrate the power of nonviolence. Turn the tide, change the course of history. We've demonstrated that love, that's why the new translation, biblical translation, faith, hope, and charity, they read faith, hope, and love because love is stronger than charity. Charity is not the policy that should be embraced by uh, public policy. It, it, it's love, because charity will give a hungry man a fish sandwich, but in a few minutes he'll be hungry again. Love moves beyond that and teaches him how to fish. And love moves beyond that and, and, and provides job training so he can get a job and earn money and buy his own fish. Love moves beyond that. Love sees that he has a, earns a livable wage on the job and Love will see that he has health insurance and, 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 and protection and care. Love will, not only that, love will move to see that the water in which he fishes is not polluted so that the fish are ever, for this is my father's work for me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It is in the application of the moral imperatives that America can continue the process of our own liberation and emancipation from materialism Visions of mothers can be healed. There is a power from above. God's not dead. He's still alive. He's still in charge. Uh, you have to try him. Uh, you have to get in the way. And, and the black movement helped pull America in the way of God's power. The book of Genesis says that I being in the way
don't want that bowl that's in there. It's not got the name of the bowl. Some, some kind of one bowl they have in there. It's not got the name. Anybody know the name of the bowl? Liberty Bowl. I do. I just want to see if you pay attention. <laughs> Liberty Bowl. And Alabama was playing Illinois. Now, I had to see the game because Alabama had its first black quarterback. So I had to see the game because I had to help the boy. And uh, I looked in the paper. It was in Memphis. I did a few telecasts. I looked. I couldn't find it anywhere. So I called the Memphis Press Cinnabon on the paper. I said, I can't find the Liberty Bowl in the television uh, log here. He said, well, it's being blacked out in Memphis. I said, I beg your pardon? Yeah, being blacked out, not being blacked out, being whited out. Ain't no black had nothing to do with that. <laughs> He, he said, well, you, you can call anything you want. You ain't going to see the game in Memphis. He said, you got to go 35 miles outside of Memphis to see the game. So I told my wife, I said, you know, I got to see this game. I'm originally from Alabama. Alabama got a first quarterback, black quarterback, and playing in the Liberty Bowl. I got to see this game. Call your niece and tell her to come out here and bring me her compass and her, her geography book. And I got a map, and I whipped up my long since forgotten geometrical principles and put the compass down and set it for 40 miles and made a circle and looked on the map and lo and behold to the to the west it intersected a place called Forest City, Arkansas. Anybody know that where that is down there? Don't spend all your life in Michigan. Go down there. <laughs> and, 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 and it was just across the Mississippi River. I said, see there, I told you we always got one more river to cross. And, uh, and, we sent, and, 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 and I told my driver, I said, listen, go, and, go and, and help get some sandwiches and get the car. We got one more river to cross. <laughs> Give me some sandwiches and cord to cord. And we're going over to Fort City, uh, Arkansas. And we got in the car and we drove over there across that river. And I went up to the Holy Day Inn. I told you I'd check, I'd never leave home without it. I gave up my card, got the biggest suite they had in the, in the place, and that black quarterback and I beat the devil at uh, the <laughs> University of Illinois. Now, the, the power, the power was coming down. I just wasn't in the way. I had to move. America had to be moved to get in the way of the power of the creator, which has no, is no respecter of persons, which has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the earth. And when we got in the way, the power came down. We saw it. I think we must continue this community of conscience, coalition of conscience, and this, the, the, the forces that, 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 that made the movement strong, the academic community, religious community, students, the civil rights community. Together we turned America wrong side to right side. We must do it again. We must continue the process. I don't know, some Americans, you know, where I don't know if you can do, you, you, if you're not in the way, get up. Get in the way. And the power can come down to reveal to us the glory of the Lord and the beauty oneness of the human family, profiling the black presence in this country, opens that kind of photo journal that is a beautiful picture of not only where we've come from, but where we are and where we yet must go. That's my profile of the black presence in this country. Thank you very much. seated. Uh, there is refreshment to follow, but before we do that, I know that some of you have uh, questions, and we wouldn't want to deny you that opportunity. And then there is a special presentation to be made uh, following uh, a few questions. 
Who would like to be first? Don't be shy. Pick up some easy ones. Come to the microphone, then they'll all be able to hear you, please. Well, I think that they can hear me. Okay, <laughs> speak up. I was just reading the New York Times while we were waiting for you, and I saw that um, the person from Atlanta is being elevated to, and I was reading his profile, being elevated to, uh, I believe it's deputy. Deputy Attorney General. Attorney General. And I wanted you to, I saw a couple of quotes from you <coughs> in that article, but I wanted you to give us your. <laughs> your chief of middle. Well, now, first of all, let me make it clear. He is a Republican, and he is a conservative, and he is black. Uh, don't expect W. I I shouldn't be disrespectful. <clears throat> don't expect President Bush <laughs> to appoint Johnny Cochran to run the Department of Justice. Now, if you think he's going to do that, you live in a woozy-woozy, never-never land. That is not going to happen. So in terms of, of Larry Thompson, Larry Thompson uh, is not a Clarence Thomas. He represented Clarence Thomas in the hearing, but that lawyer represented everybody. He just represented the guy Lance Bud, who was convicted of political corruption, is going to jail, but that don't make him politically corrupt. Lawyers, lawyers represent anybody, like preachers bury anybody. I bury folks who were, you know, were awful, but don't don't put me in the same casket with them. Uh, Larry Thompson is a, one of the most able, astute, skillful lawyers. He's fair. He's conservative. But as I say, you ain't gonna get Jerry <laughs> Goodmarsh and I. In my, I, I, how do you spell his name? I spell it R-E-L-I-E-F. I'm relieved that he didn't appoint another Clarence Thomas. And I'm glad to see uh, him reach to that kind of African American. Uh, so, you know, it ain't gonna be no, he ain't gonna give me the job if I were a lawyer. So I'm glad to see that he's a man of integrity. He was a US attorney in the Northern District of Georgia, which includes Atlanta for four years. He was an equal opportunity prosecutor. That is, he prosecuted you black, white, Republican, Democrat. If he felt you had violated the law, he would do it. I think, and he, and he believes that affirmative action, some programs can be constitutionally implemented, which is, takes him out of the bag with, with what's his name? Clarence Thomas. I hate to keep calling his name. He's one of the five confused people on the Supreme Court. <laughs> He's a very powerful people. Anytime five votes can veto 50 some million votes, that's, that's a pretty hello. I didn't mean to get political up here. <clears throat> yes, I did. But, but that's the, the, the answer to the question, I think he's the best we could hope for out of this administration. And he can be that. He's so, got so much integrity. He can remind Ashcroft. Say, remember that conversion you had during the hearings? You know, he had a Damascus Road conversion during the hearings. You know what I'm talking about Damascus Road. Anybody know Damascus Road? Yeah, right. He was on the way to the hearing trying to get to the Department of Justice and God struck him and he got him. He said, yes, I believe in this and that. Very, very sharp, drastic conversion. And Larry can be there to remind him when he refuses to prosecute somebody on a hate crime, Larry can say, hey, remember what you said when you got converted into hearings? And I think it can be a positive force. So I'm, I'm relieved. He is not Johnny Cochran. He will not be Johnny Cochran, but I think he'll bring dignity and integrity uh, to that office. Well, you were just doing scratching your head. I'm sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for no further questions. All right. I, 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 ushers, bring the offering, please. I'm going <laughs> <laughs> Yes, dear. In your opinion, or um, do you think the civil rights movement has ended, or do you think that we're going to see a resurgence of another social movement like it? Well, you know, I guess I get a little disturbed 
when people talk about the civil rights movement only in historical context. It never stopped. Martin died. Media interests died. But the movement never stopped. The, uh, I mentioned Wynn Dixon, the, the, the most effective boycott we had since Montgomery went on. We had in the 80s against Wynn Dixon in those 13 southern states, but the national media didn't pay much attention to it. In, in, in Decatur, Alabama, in, June, in May of 1979, I led a demonstration to free a young man named Tommy Lee Hines, a young retarded man who was accused of raping two white women. In the, in the account of the rape, the police said that he had driven a car. Now, Tommy couldn't ride a bike because his, what do you call it, motor, you know, his, his muscles and his brain never could coordinate. He couldn't ride a bike. And they said he drove a car. And we went up there to try to save him. And uh, we eventually did. But in one demonstration one day, they shot. The Klan was waiting on us. We heard the Klan was waiting, and as soon as we got downtown to Katy, Alabama, we called the highway patrol, they wouldn't come. There was nobody there but the Decatur the police, and there were more Klansmen there than there were Decatur police. And so we took everybody to church and said, told them what was happening. If you want to go, come, leave me no weapons. Must have no weapons. I wouldn't let my wife march with me. She always did. I wouldn't let her march. So she drove the car in the back of the march. When we got to the corner, there was the Klan. And the they shot four young people in the head. Tried to kill me. I heard bullets going over my head. Two young men who were marching b beside me picked me up and carried me out of the line of fire. They shot into the car where my wife was driving. Glass fell out of the windshield over the seat where she fell down. She said she lay there about 15 minutes. It was really about 15 seconds. But it seemed like 15 minutes to her when she drove away. That never made national news. That was the worst disaster in any demonstration in the history of the movement. Four young people shot in the parts and none of them died. But media lost interest. But the movement has not stopped. When we turned out to vote in November, I cut a rap CD with a group called Nate the Great. We had a rap. They were rapping and I was preaching and it was good. It was, we, we, we sent it all the country and everything. And, and we turned out to vote, people. I mean, people turned out to vote. Didn't, didn't go carry Michigan, <laughs> did he? Yeah, well, they, they tried to redeem themselves from Wallace. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, 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 that's the movement. The movement has, it's not just now in the streets. It can be in the street, but it's also in the voting booth. We got nearly 40 Congress people uh, fighting. They, they walked out when they swore, you know, they had to make a protest. We, he won the election. They come in front, and I went down to Tallahassee. And the day of the inauguration, we were in Tallahassee. The movement is still moving. The media don't, they don't pay much attention to it. They think we got it made. Hello? But the median income of African Americans today is still about 60% of the median income of white Americans. And, and that's only 3% from what it was in 1957 when Martin and the rest of us met in New Orleans and organized SCLC. So we've only, in, in 44 years, we've come 3% increase. So the movement ain't dead. It's just spread out. And it's in different places. And, and people worry about it. We've got more leaders now and just as effective as we ever had. We just tend to follow the media's uh, uh, inclination to focus on one Negro, hello, one color. No, what is it? One, one black, one black. Was there. One African American, and 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 that confuses us. You've got leaders in education. What did I talk about a while ago? American Express, Brother Chanel. Ah, he's the top dog. I not I can get me a card now. <laughs> but what I do now when I get behind, I call him up. I hear Chanel. I'm a little behind. <laughs> brother, how about soul brother, take care of me. But I mean, a woman heads Mackerel House. Up until the other day, a man led Avis. 
He quit the other day and left, but, but, but the movement goes on in every sphere of life, and we'll continue. We're we still got too many folks unregistered and too many folks who don't vote. We still got to do that. The movement goes on in, on campuses where, where, where students are developing caucuses and trying to work across racial lines to achieve certain elements of justice on the campus. We, we're pushing for more black faculty at the Michigan State, I mean at Michigan, University of Michigan, not Michigan State. I'm, I'm getting mixed up. It's Michigan. University of Michigan, it's in Ann Arbor. That's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But we, 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 we're talking, so we're fighting everywhere. But we, we, got, we have almost 10,000 black elected officials. When Martin died, we had about 400. But the 10,000 still represent less than 2% of the total number of elected officials. The movement goes on. Don't let them make you think it's history. It is history, but it's also contemporary. And you are making history. You members of the community of faith and the coalition of conscience. I don't know what kind you're making. You have to determine that. If you ain't in the way, you ain't making no good history. But if you get in the way, you can be an instrument of continuing the process of change. It ain't over yet. Anytime they can drag a man through the street in Texas. There are some things that uh, you uh, know about uh, what went on in Florida to disenfranchise us that uh, we uh, might not have heard here in Michigan on your first-hand experiences. Don't you read the Michigan Chronicle? <laughs> <laughs> Black newspaper don't get up this far. <laughs> I doubt there's anything you haven't heard. All kind of things happened in Florida. Police officers showed up near black precincts at a peculiar time of the day with stopping people doing racial profiling, people on the way to the polls. Some ballots disappeared. They used the church for a precinct, and the preacher kept standing right there waiting for them to come get the boxes, and the next morning they still hadn't come and got the boxes. And finally some police came and got it. They don't know what happened to the boxes. And you know the dimples, the chads, the hairs, the, all that stuff, you know, ordinarily, if it's got a, you know, if it looked like it been messed with, they counted this time. They didn't count them. And of course, a number of things. And they still count on an ad or the New York Times and the Miami Herald, and I think the Wall Street Journal, they're counting. They're going to release the figures pretty soon. Uh, it ain't going to change nothing except those who had doubt. Their doubts will be. <laughs> be moved move from twilight to to noonday with the bright sun. So many things happened, and 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 if you thought the movement was over, that ought to be a wake up call. <laughs> we we fought, bled, and died for the right to vote, and 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 not just for the right to vote, but the right to have the votes counted. And here five confused people veto the votes of 50-some million people. Five confused people. Three white males, one white female, and one, 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 Before we adjourn to the refreshment beam in the next room, uh, call on Representative Mike Murphy for a very special presentation. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Anderson. This has truly been another great day. This month has been special because of what the School of Osteopathic Medicine Dr. Anderson had decided to do. And our two previous speakers, um, Dr. Y.T. Walker and Dr. Uh, Charles Adams, uh, we honored and saluted their service uh, from the Michigan legislature. And before I present this special tribute to Dr. Laurie, let me just say that it's been a blessing to 
have been in his presence today as we had lunch together and as he told the story. And uh, the movement is alive and well. And I'm so glad that he's here. I grew up in the 60s. And the coals that burned back then burn today. And that's why I'm pastor of the church and public official as well. And some people ask, well, how can you do both? And Dr. Lowry helped me see that today because he's done both in his career. And so I want to thank him for uh, just being here at Michigan State today. And on behalf of the Michigan legislature and Representative Kwame Kilpatrick, who made history here in Michigan by being the first uh, African-American leader of uh, the Democratic Caucus, and who is the son of our own Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick uh, out of Detroit. And Kwame and I wanted to honor uh, Dr. Lowry for coming here. And so we present this special tribute to you, acknowledging your presence here as a visiting minority faculty uh, uh, lecturer in this series. And we want to honor and pay tribute to you and uh, salute you for speaking truth to the powerful and speaking hope to the powerless. And we say God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> In case you didn't hear the question, he's asking if this is a bigger one than he gave uh, last week to Wyatt Walker. <laughs> we thank you all for coming, and we welcome you back here next week. Refreshment is available next door, and I'm going to ask uh, Reverend Lowry if he'll go next door with us, and maybe you can meet with him and ask your question individually. Thank you for coming today.